Thank you for the introdu introduction. My name is Ben. I am an engineer here at Honeycomb. This is a story. It's my story. It's where I came from. I started writing code long ago, and uh, I want to tell you a story about what I learned along the way, how I started, uh, what the instructions were about how to talk to your users, how to communicate with, uh, with the people that are running your, your applications. This is my story, but I've heard it echoed back to me from other people at other times. Uh, it, it, it may be a true story, it may be a false narrative set up here to, uh, to push structured events because they are awesome, uh, but it doesn't really matter. It's, it's a story, that's what we're here to do. So, in the beginning of time, there was Hello World. All of you have seen this in one form or another. Uh, this is copied out of uh, KNR for the nice old school C fans. Um, and this is, this is what people tell us to do. You want to communicate something to your users? Printf, hello world, there it goes. All of the output of our software is measured by this way of saying, here's a string, blat it out somewhere, whether it's to a screen or a console or a log or something else. This is our mechanism for uh, taking the information from within our application and communicating it to the outside world. Now, I started with, with this ages and ago and have written Many, many programs, most of them small, uh, spend more time in Bash than anything else, but there's Ruby and Python and Perl and Go and all the other bits. Uh, the languages vary, the print statements are forever. So let's look at something a little bit more modern. This is a fancy new language, this is Go, this is recent, this is highly concurrent, this is the way we build software now. It does all sorts of amazing things and, well, it also hasn't really changed in the last 20 years. We hit an error, there's our print statement. We have a calculation on how much time we spent, there's our print statement. Because this is how we talk to our users, this is what we were taught, this is the story that we're building. So, what does it look like when you run this thing? Well, it tells you what it's doing. And it's accomplishing its job, right? It's telling us what it's doing. It is exposing its internal state to us, the people that are running it. That's fine, it's, it's successful, it works, right? And not really. So there are a couple of problems. The first problem is that you and I aren't really the consumers for this sort of output anymore. The people that are gonna be reading this stuff and doing things with it, well, they're not actually people. Uh, software is going to be reading it, right? Other, other programs are going to be reading it and taking stock of looking for errors, looking for successes, measuring timers, uh, collecting them in some way. And every time we have one of these uh, beautifully written pieces of prose, like Auth Process Slept, uh, we're inventing a new way of communicating from the strict computer-oriented way of consuming data, right? Every one of these is gonna be different. If you and I wrote this, they would, maybe you'd say auth process snoozed instead of slept. And so every one of these is gonna be new. There's no standards, there's no structure, there's nothing to it. We need structure, we're gonna use structured logs. Now this is actually very easy. All languages have ways of doing structured logs now. We just do a couple of substitutions. We're taking out the printf statement and putting in a logarith statement. As I said, this is Go. Uh, the, the specifics will be different on a per language basis. But um, you know, basically, you look for that little percent plus V uh, or percent S or percent D or any of these string substitutions. Everywhere you see one of those, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity for structured logs because structured logs are the future. And this is the way that makes it easy for machines to parse them and and take action on them. Getting out of the diff view, um, we have the same code up here now. Uh, it is well structured. Uh, we have the error, the error is passed along, uh, we have our measurement of duration, it is its own field. Um, we're done. We have now joined the future, we have structured our, uh, our logs. Uh, as uh, that, that Twitter, uh, uh, Twitter link at the top is uh, Charity saying at the beginning of the year, if you have one New Year's resolution, Structure your logs. That's it, nothing else, just do that. You will be happy for it, and you will. Because now we look at the output of that same program, and behold, so many keys, such lovely structure, 
all of the time fields are marked as time. All of the, the strings are marked with quotes. The numbers are, are values, uh, floats that can be passed around. Uh, we have succeeded. We can, we've done our job. We have structured logs. We get to go home. Uh, no, 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 we don't. Um, you know where this is going. Uh, I mentioned two problems, right? The first, uh, nobody can read that stuff we were looking at either uh, earlier. Well, well, by nobody, I mean no computer can read that stuff we were looking at. Um, but the second is uh, not about structure, but about scale. This is fine when we're running one instance of one ser service, one application on our laptop. Uh, we can read it, no problem. What happens when 20 of these are running at the same time? Uh, okay, it hurts. Um, that's fine. Uh, it's allowed to hurt. We're in the process of optimizing this for computers, not people. Um, so let's just like stare at it for a bit and stare through the hurt. I'm sorry, it's small. Uh, this is what's going on, right? There, it's, there's a bunch of them starting up, and then the, there's sort of this mix. Okay, one of them finished early, and then uh, you know, there's some authentication going on. There's a couple of summaries. There are errors put in there, but it's structured, right? We can we can deal with this, we can consume it, we can, we can send it off to our uh, visualization and, and we're good to go. Are we, really? Let's look at those errors. We see there's an error, okay. It says, womp, there's an error. Uh, who was it an error for? Well, um, don't actually know. Uh, that's somewhere earlier, right? The, there was all of the, the, the starting up and, and processing and authenticating, and the authenticating part is where it tells you what user it's authenticating. By the time it's gotten here, uh, it, we're out of luck. Somebody had a shitty experience. Don't know who. Better luck next time. Maybe try again. So, Okay, we've been down this road before. We made a small change to our, to our application in order to move further towards this glorious future. We know how to solve this problem. We tie everything together with request IDs. Okay, we, recre we create a request ID, that's great. Uh, we love UUIDs, they're unique. Um, we can thread it through our program. Okay, this was a little bit more work. And it's a little bit ugly. Uh, you know, there's, there's these variables passed all over the place that don't really feel like they're relevant to the actual work that the service is doing, but, you know, uh, all, in the, all in the service of, of observability and, and understanding what's going on. So what does this one look like when it runs? Oh, God. Okay. Still, terrible to look at. Again, people, not people, machines, that's fine. Uh, let's stare at it really, really, really hard. Okay, we found one of those errors. Uh, we s skim over, we can find this ID, we can back up, okay, we see where it started, uh, we see what happened, great, we succeeded, it was user number eight that failed. Job done. Okay, again, j job not really done. Um, this does work. It is clearly a better place. We have improved our lot in life. Uh, we can piece these things back together. It's a real pain. Nobody wants to do this. You're going to sit through these things and pour through them, or you're going to build this, this large uh, processing pipeline on the other side of your process. So now, instead of just having one service that's doing a thing, you have this other thing that's taking all of the bits that that first one did and trying to put them back together and join them up. And uh, No, we've done all that work of threading things through, and we can do better. We should do better. Doing better is almost no additional work. So we're looking at that same section of code again. Uh, a couple of things have changed. Instead of just threading through this one run ID, uh, we're, we're building a context. This is the go way of doing things. It's different for each language. But we're, we're participating in the community-supported way of uh, managing data as it flows through your program. And this is a good thing, because this means that when you're using other libraries that are part of the same community, they will be doing the same thing. Uh, everything will flow. Um, and there's one other change here in that we're using a little, uh, you know, again, language dependent in, in Go, uh, map string interface and Python a dictionary, that sort of thing. We're collecting all of the attributes that it took to run this application together. And we're only emitting our logs at the end. There are two return points in this code, uh, one in the middle where it errors and one at the end. But by using this little container to pass around and collect all these bits, 
Now, you already had to thread something through all of your logic in order to get that request ID that we were using to tie things back together. So just thread a little bit more through and emit it all together. And uh, what we've got here is a piece of code that when it runs will actually give us content that is readable by both people and machines that contains everything about what it took to run this individual service. So let's look at one of those in isolation. And I, I didn't do the widescreen thing because you know, it's slides, um, but they're so pretty. Not only do they have you know, all of the different bits that are interesting, they have the most interesting bits that we need when we're looking at a successful one up top, we see which user it was and how long it took and all of what, when they started and you know, whether they hit the cache and all of this stuff bundled together. So with a single object of data, we can understand everything about what this service did. In the bottom case, with an error, uh, we see you know, the, the fact that it errored, whether, again, whether it hit the cache and um, the, which user it is. You can take these bundles and you can process them easily. You're not going to have an enormous bunch of infrastructure trying to put all of the uh, shells back together again in order to uh, visualize your, your, uh, your processes and your servers and, and all of the things that you're trying to run. They're, they're there and simple. So let's just go through them again. Um, things that were nice for people to read are not nice for machines to read. Just that's it. We need to change all of our code and stop printing things for people and start printing things for machines. But even just doing that is not quite enough because once you have all of these beautiful bits of structure, each one of them really only represents a small portion of what it took to handle a given unit of work. So we need to put those back together. And the easiest place to put them back together is when they're happening, not after the fact when everything has been scattered and you're trying to pick up all the pieces and reconstruct reality, put them together as they're going on because that's where the data is flowing. That's where the, uh, the um, users are interacting with this service. That's the point to keep it together in one place so that you can work with it afterwards. Uh, the mechanics will be different for each language. That's fine. Uh, this idea of uh, holding on to all of the bits until you've gotten to a place where the entire work is complete and you can say, here's everything, uh, essentially means that you're deferring emitting uh, uh, logs of, or events about your service to the end. That's fine. Uh, every reasonable language these days has a way of doing that in both successful and errored conditions. Uh, and finally, uh, take these beautiful bundles of data and send them somewhere so that you can make pretty graphs out of them. Because that's when you take it back from optimizing for machines to optimizing for people. We're not going to look at these huge bundles of JSON and get anything useful. We're going to look at pretty graphs. We're going to look at lines and see this one's going that way and that one's going that way. And we're going to make conclusions out of those uh, because, again, people. That's what we see and, and understand. So take those blobs, send them somewhere useful, and then you'll understand your services. And everybody will be happy. And we truly can go home. The answers are going to be different depending on the type of service you're working on. Uh, for a given web service, where events represent uh, you know, requests of a web service, uh, they usually complete in, I don't know, tens, hundreds of milliseconds, uh, maybe a couple of seconds. Um, usually, I'm not going to be able to intercept any of those and find out why they're blocking. So the fact that they are emitted after they have finished their block uh, maybe they're delayed by 30 seconds because they're waiting on a TCP timeout. Um, generally, that's okay. The, my speed of response as a person is going to be in the range of minutes uh, rather than milliseconds. So, nah. Um, that's, it's a different answer when you come across uh, services that behave on the time range of minutes or hours or days, right? So, uh, if you are processing uh, large constructs in a data warehouse, and each one of these takes six hours to complete. Um, so they get delayed, and instead of waiting six hours, you're waiting eight hours, and you can't really find out why they're delayed in the middle of those six hours. Still maybe okay, because you're not setting that kind of SLA. Um, there certainly are times when I've been very curious about why events are getting blocked up. Uh, 
uh, events that are, that are landing against a queue and refusing to go through at all, and I'm seeing them, you know, th I'm seeing the downstream service refuse to get anything. I'm like, where are these things going? You know, I, I see nothing because they've, they've stopped here and they haven't emitted their data until they've completed. Um, within any uh, sufficiently uh, concrete piece of advice, there are always going to be different aspects of it. Uh, often, for larger services, these are going to, especially in our like, burgeoning microservice world, uh, these are going to be cooperations between many different services. So while I might not get the actually blocked events until they finish, uh, I'll see other evidence of where that block is coming from. Uh, and if this is a habitual problem rather than a one-time outage, uh, it may be time to break, out, break up that specific service into uh, the, the types of related events and send them to something that can visualize related events very easily. Uh, so there's an ebb and flow, right? There's this, this spectrum, this, uh, everything is, uh, you know, its own individual line uh, to everything waits to the very end. Uh, any service-oriented architecture is going to be somewhere in the middle uh, because of the fact that each, each service is likely to be emitting its own view of the world, uh, in addition to having something that's more trace-like in a, a global view. Um, so you'll get both. I'm not one for absolutes. Uh, that's not often a problem that uh, I've, I've come across in a way that uh, uh, makes it too difficult to, to see what's going on. Um, trying to think of an example of the last time I, I had that kind of block without a timeout in a way that actually got me some data in a reasonable time frame. I'm not sure. Do you have an example? Yeah, so uh, the example is um, uh, things, specific queries in a database blocked in a way that backed up, uh, put back pressure on the other services until they filled up and then everything came tumbling down. Uh, yeah, certainly spent my fair share of time staring at the MySQL show full process list, uh, hide all the things that are sleeping, um, you know, th th those sorts of bits. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a good example. Uh, I think in, in my recent experience, that, that falls into the timeout category. Uh, hopefully, the, uh, backing up, the individual uh, downstream services getting slow, uh, especially in a sharded world, and backing up a larger cluster of servers is, is a problem that uh, has come up many times. There's a corner of people over here intimately familiar with it. Um, uh, I'm referring to, to having worked on Parse, where we would have a sharded Mongo backend, and one shard would get slow, and everything would just come crashing down. It was terrible. Uh, and in fact, the way that we were able to most easily diagnose that was through uh, uh, complex events being sent to a uh, visualization that we could see, OK, uh, which ones of these are timing out? Because they, they did time out in a relatively reasonable frame, time frame. I don't remember. Do you remember 30 seconds? Uh, 45 a minute, something in that range. Um, and we'd say, OK, show me all of the queries, and then uh, split by uh, shard and customer ID, and suddenly you know, one line bubbles to the top. And that's coming from these well-structured events that were emitted after they completed. They timed out. Uh, but they were frequent enough, and the timeout was quick enough, and our response as people was slow enough. Uh, it all worked out together. So the question is, do we have any people, have I interacted with any people that are interested in keeping the human readable version of the log in addition to the structured machine parsable version of the log? I can't think of any examples. Uh, mostly because, uh, so the, the thing that comes up more frequently is um, that, that people want to split a log to one place for a long time archival. You know, I'm contracted to keep all things for seven years and then delete them to the day. I, uh, okay, you, you have these, these things you have to do. Um, and uh, S3 buckets are really good at that. Um, but no, I, I don't think I've heard anybody arguing to keep the human readable version uh, just because people don't read logs like that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so to, to recap, what, what, uh, do I have problems deciding what is a unit of work? Uh, because a unit of work for different audiences might mean different things. Uh, for the customer who is sending me a, a request, 
Um, their version of a unit of work is, wait, th th they sent me a request, I'm supposed to give them an answer. That's a unit of work, right? But within my service, I have six different things, and each one of them is handling a part of that. Each one of those is a unit of work. Well, let, look at one of those services. That one service, uh, let's say the authentication service, it's gonna check its cache. It's gonna uh, fetch from the database. It's going to validate some tokens. It's going to uh, do some parsing. It's gonna uh, write to the new cache if, if necessary. Each of those is a unit of work. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, unit of work is a fluid description, and it varies depending on what you're interested in finding out about the service and the, uh, your, your degree of interacting with it. Um, even more so within a larger organization, uh, you might have different teams responsible for different services. So from the UI's perspective, uh, handing off a request to the storage engine and getting back uh, an answer, that's a unit of work from its perspective. It's going to put a timer around it and it's going to you know, measure things and so on. Um, but the storage team has a completely different definition of unit of work. Uh, for the storage team, it's going to accept this request, go off and find all of the different segments that are going to participate, examine their timestamps, collect them, do a merge step, hand it back to your distributed in infrastructure. Um, yeah, totally different. Uh, so you can do both. One unit of work that is a large sphere uh, does not preclude also having a unit of work that is a smaller sphere. And some of the information will be shared, some of it won't. Uh, and over time, as you continue to develop and work on this service, uh, different aspects of it will become more interesting units of work and then fade from interestingness. Uh, as, uh, at, at Honeycomb, as we were building out our secondary storage, um, uh, we were very interested in the performance of individual block reads against S3. That was the, the unit of timing that became relevant to developing this, this, uh, this service. And then afterwards, we're like, yeah, that's, that's too much. We don't need that. We, we did our job. This part works. It's understood. We're going to back off. And we no longer had that level of granularity as a unit of work. And that's fine. That's part of development. It's an ongoing process. Uh, you're, you're, the number of fields, the variety of fields uh, that are going to be present in your events will change. That's OK. Um, it's, a, it's a tool that's available. Uh, it's like in a, uh, uh, there was an analogy I, I heard earlier today, uh, not, not microscope, but it's like uh, switching the lenses in a microscope. That was it. You, know, some, you start with like the 2x magnification or 10x or whatever it is microscopes use these days, and then you find the right area, and then you switch to the 50x, and then you go look at something, and then you back out again. Um, yeah, that's, that's reality. That's where we live. That's the, the job that we need to do. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>